Hello everyone, it's Sally here with NNM Studios. And on today, we are here with one of my personal favorite operatic singers ever in the world. He just so happens to be this wonderful man sitting back here by the name of Professor Richard Hobson. Um, can you tell the people a little bit about yourself? Sure. Your experiences. Well, I'm originally from Belzoni, Mississippi, a very small town in the Delta. It is known as the heart of the Delta. Um, that's where I was born and raised. My grandmother was a minister and she loved music. Her whole family loved music. They were either musicians and or ministers. And in her case, she was both. And she gave me piano lessons because she wanted me to play in the church while she mm. preached, you know. And at first I thought it was an imposition. I was embarrassed because after every service she would insist that they give me money for playing and they didn't have any money and they would give begrudgingly and I would go under the piano bench. I was so embarrassed. But um, she gave me piano lessons so that I could do that and that started my interest in music. I was really a pianist before I was a singer. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I was studying piano and I didn't really get into singing until I got into high school. But yeah, so that's how I got into uh, to music. My mother had six children and I was number five. And my grandmother gave piano lessons to everybody. She gave them one, two, three, and four. And when she got to five, she got the right one. The <laughs> other ones didn't want it. <laughs> and even my baby sister after me, when I left, my grandmother forced her to play the piano in the church. And she, she did not like it. Um, but no, she didn't have to force me. So yeah, that's how I got started. As a matter of fact, I loved the piano so that my lessons were on Mondays. I remember coming out of school every Monday and going straight to the piano teacher's house. And I would have my piece memorized because I had practiced it every day between the last Monday. Oh, wow. And so I came with it memorized every Monday. Hmm. So let me ask you this. What, what sparked your interest to become, uh, uh, to begin singing? Uh, to begin singing? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, where I was raised, we, uh, my grandmother, of course, we sang hymns and spirituals in the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, opera caught my ear. I can tell you the first time I ever heard an operatic voice, and you'll probably find this interesting. Because, you know, I used to love Aretha Franklin, Diana Ross, The Temptations, all those wow. people. I okay. was raised on those people. But when Aretha made this song called Ain't No Way, I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. Her sister went up to that high A, oh, in the back. Right. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. And so that sparked my interest in the operatic voice. And, you know, ever since then, you know, I just went wherever I heard the sound. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Um, let's let's talk about the Negro spiritual. The Negro spiritual, okay. Um, first of all, give me your own view and your own opinion of the importance of the Negro spiritual. Well, the Negro spiritual, the Negro spiritual is of the utmost importance. Uh, in music in general uh, in this country and really all over the world because it is the basis for all other music styles that come out of America except for perhaps the, the American Indians because they were here before us but because they've been so denigrated and decimated we don't get to hear much of mm -hmm. the culture but the Negro spiritual was the music that allowed us to exist it gave us the reason for going on because if you can imagine living during a time where you can't plan from one day to the next. You can't make a future plans for your children, for yourself, because you don't have control over that. Mm -hmm. Your children may be sold the next day or right. the next week, or your husband may be killed for, you know, disobeying. So the spirituals were the one thing that we could hold on to that they couldn't take away from us and that we could find hope in, you know. We grabbed onto it and it really is responsible for our survival to a large degree. Right, 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 you right, know? right. It's so much history in, the, in, in spirituals and um, um, different methods in one one in one way uh, than one song can be sung, uh, and it'll uh, emphasize one particular thing that the song is talking about. Um, some Negro spirituals, of course, we know some of them to be instructions. Oh yes. You know, as far as you know, especially when you go into the Underground Railroad. Follow the Drinking Gourd and other songs. I, I don't know if you remember the right. episode of uh, Fresh Prince when, uh, <laughs> I don't remember that. when the Ut sang, Follow the Drinking Gourd. Mm -hmm. And right. it was the most beautiful thing ever. But it's just, it's amazing how uh, 
you know, it's so many Negro spirituals with different meanings and well, yeah. um in a sense with the younger generation it's like a lost art form and i just i, I can't wait for the the day or to be able uh, uh, with our studio to be able to bring more light onto it you know that mm -hmm. you know you could be young and enjoy a negro spiritual as a matter of fact i in my own personal opinion i love the negro spiritual because of the fact that there's no instrumentation and the instrument is just simply the voice mm -hmm. and you, you could be so expressive just right. by using your vocal cords in the proper way. And, um... Well, the whole idea, the spirit, mm -hmm. is the operative word. They have to be sung with the utmost spirit. Yes, sir. And that spirit is what allowed us to survive. It, it gave us something to hold on to. And you're right, the spiritual was an originally a cappella. There were no instruments in right. the cotton field. There was no piano. There was no orchestra. Mm -hmm. And... You know, we sang spirituals that gave us strength and commitment and the desire to go on. Because we would sing like, didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Then why couldn't he deliver us, right? And then you would sing a song. Uh, all these characters, a lot of them were from the Old Testament. Joshua did the battle of Jericho. And the walls come tumbling down. Well, that means the walls of slavery could come coming down, tumbling down for us. Or uh, what else? I mean, there are so many, and, and you're right, they would have what we call a double entendre, or double meaning, you know? Mm -hmm. Wait in the water, wait in the water, children. You know, when you were escaping, you know, you were going to take the river, or whatever it was, the body of water that was near, so that they, that they could not um, see your footprints, and they couldn't send the dogs after you. So the, the, those people were very, very smart. Yeah. They had to be. And... Uh, so yeah, and you know, the blues, jazz, all of that stuff evolves from the Negro spiritual. Yes, yes, yes. Now, while we're talking about the Negro spiritual, yes. although the people can't see it right now, there's a picture of the diva of divas on the wall, Miss Leontine Price. Madam Preacher. The madam. Yes. <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit about Leontine Price. Okay. Well, Leontine, of course, is from Mississippi. Just yes, like me, yes, right? Yes, she is. Yes. She's from Laurel, Mississippi. And, um... The first time I actually heard Leontine Price, I actually heard her. I was in high school. Oh. Uh, I was, I, yeah, I was in high school. I went to, uh, I was living in Minnesota by the time. That's a whole other story. But they took me to a concert of hers. And it was, of course, magnificent. You know, it was glorious. But I had already been listening to her recordings uh, on record. You don't know what a record is. But yeah, Leontine Price has been always been one of my idols. And she was a magnificent singer, a magnificent, uh, just in every way. Her discipline, her commitment, her love for her art. Um, she's had so many things that she taught me just by reading about her and listening to her. Uh, and just, yeah, just a magnificent, and you know, she's still living. Mm -hmm. She's still living. Yes, she is. Yes. Uh, but I saw her at the Metropolitan Opera. I saw her in concert in Dallas when I was in graduate school. And when I was in graduate school, I was poor. I didn't have a lot of money, right? So Leontine Price was singing at this large concert hall in Dallas. And they had um, above the stage the area for the chorus to sing. Whenever they were doing a large work with chorus, like the Beethoven Ninth or the Verdi Requiem, mm -hmm. the chorus would be up and above around the stage. But with Leontine singing, they didn't need that. So all that was empty, so they sold those to the students. The, what they call the nosebleed seats, mm -hmm. $15. But while I was up there listening during the first half, I spotted a seat down in the middle of what looked like the third row from the stage. I made a beeline for that seat as soon as intermission came. And I was sitting there, and she came out, and just to think of it now, it gives me chills. I started crying. <laughs> that voice was just like, I can't even describe the magnificence of it. But it, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing up close. And t I didn't realize I was crying. But that's the effect that that voice could have on you. And you can't really tell from listening to it on the record. Being live is... It's, 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 oh, oh. Her voice would just fill any hall to the back of the hall, every crevice and, you know, inch of that hall with beauty. And no matter how loud or how soft, her soft notes were almost more incredible than her loud notes. It's amazing. <laughs> Let, 
let, now let's talk about something. Um, let's talk about a proper technique. Caring for the voice. Okay. Um, what to, uh, I don't know, we kind of going off the subject a little bit, but no, no, it's, it's been known that a lot of times singers are known to be kind of bougie as far as carrying their, 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 their scarf around their neck and, you know, making mm. sure you're humming around and you have your cup of tea <laughs> and there's many memes about it. But yes. let, let's talk, let's talk a little while for like the importance of like, let's say there's a performance. What would, what would be on your menu for the day? Well, first of all, if I can, I don't talk. On the day that I have a really important performance, because it's just you—you you want your voice in the mode for singing. You want your mind in the mode for singing, and the concentration has to be very deep and very profound. So I don't talk. Uh, I hum very early in the morning. I start with a light hum, you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm, and then I leave it alone. Then I may go have something to eat, and I come back and I do it a little later, and then. Later in the day, I start singing the high notes to make sure they're there. And then you run through some phrases of whatever it is you have to sing. And you go on stage and you sing. But um, you have to be, you have to care for the voice in a very particular way. Um, I contend that any voice can sing anything they want to sing. Like you, you have a great voice. You have a great voice. You can decide what you want to sing. You can sing opera, you can sing gospel, you can sing R&B. Whitney's the same way. She's been a great opera singer. Aretha, mm. great opera singer. Mahalia, great opera singer. But they chose to sing what they chose. But the voice itself has to be cared for in the same way no matter what you sing, which means no pushing and screaming mm -hmm. and uh, vocalize in a very healthy way and then keep the voice healthy and from being hoarse and that kind of thing. And then, uh, or, you, this, or, or, you know, when I used to have my lessons with you, I, I would, my lessons were on Mondays and I would have gospelitis. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one. There, there are certain students Lord. who have come to my studio who couldn't have lessons until Thursday. Ooh. Because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they were recovering from what they had done in church the day before. Oh, no, no, no. And, I mean, you know, listen, I love gospel. Don't get me wrong. Of course. Yeah. I love Aretha Franklin. I love Mahalia Jackson. I love all those students. But what I don't, I mean, all those singers. But what I don't love is for students to walk through that door and can't sing and be a horse. I don't like that, you know, right. because what do you do? You have to send them away. Either they miss a lesson that week or they have to come back late in the week when you may, you may or may not have time. So, and I've had students who learn how to sing so that they didn't go through that. They learn the hard way, but they learn how to back off and they learn how to manipulate whatever it was, whatever it was they were doing so that they could save their voices. Mm -hmm. But some of them, they learn the hard way because they don't believe. 